Thank you, Sue. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, taking the time out to listen to me talk today about what I think is a very important um, disease that I think affects many of us. I think if we were all together where I could see all of your faces, I probably would ask, um, has anyone out there either had skin cancer or know someone close to them that has had skin cancer? And I guarantee that probably everybody in the room would raise their hand. Um, so I think it is, again, a very important um, issue that we have to learn about because it can potentially be prevented. And I think um, if there's anything in terms of the take home message from this, this talk is to know how we can be careful in avoiding um, sun exposure that could potentially lead to skin cancer. So as we get started, I think we should talk a little bit more um, about this, our skin. And I put down some information about the skin because I think it tends to be what I consider an, um, an unrecognized part of our body. It turns out that actually the skin is the largest organ in our body. And if you think of an organ that has purpose, uh, think of an organ as a collection of um, specialized cells that have a special function within our bodies, like our lungs that help us to breathe, um, our heart that pumps blood. The skin actually is a protection uh, from our environment. It protects us from our environment. It protects us from a lot of things. And so it plays a very important um, function. And if you think about the number of cells that our skin has, it's amazing when you think about the number, it's staggering. But what's interesting about the skin is that it varies in thickness. Um, different parts of our body have different thickness of skin, and the skin can be made up of uh, different concentration of cells. Um, the skin actually is living, it's thriving, and it it actually turns over practically every month. So if you think about your skin regenerating every month, you wonder where do all those skin cells go? Well, it turns out that we shed those skin cells and you probably don't realize that about close to 10 pounds of skin is shed every year from our bodies. And you probably don't want to know, but I'll tell you anyway, that half the dust in your home is probably created by all of the um, skin cells that you have shed. So I'm sure for you all out there that have furry pets, if your pet knew this, they probably would say, and you you get upset about me, you know, causing all of this um, shedding of hair and everything, when it turns out most of the dust in the home is created by ourselves. Um, Again, going and emphasizing to the fact that our skin is a, a protection from our environment, uh, one thing you have to realize is that our skin actually has bacteria on it. And we actually have a lot of bacteria on our skin. Doesn't necessarily cause us any harm, but the fact of the matter is, is that it, it raised question as to the fact that when we go out and buy all of these antimicrobial soaps, um, you really can't sterilize the skin because our fact is, is that our skin is colonized with so many bacteria and it's the skin that protects us from that bacteria. So when we talk about skin cancer, um, it's important to know and why is it very important to understand cancer of the skin is the fact that it is the most common cancer um, in the United States and probably the most common cancer throughout the world. Um, if you look at the frequency of skin cancer, you know, one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. And so that means that, you know, a significant number of people are going to be developing skin cancer every day. Um, it's important to know that although we always think about skin cancer occurring in fair skinned people, light complexion, the truth of the matter is, is skin cancer does not discriminate by skin color. And people with dark complexion, dark skinned people, are just as much at risk of developing skin cancer. When you look at the rates of skin cancer, it's interesting because women before the age of 50 seem to outnumber men in terms of developing skin cancer. But then as we get older, the men tend to outpace the women when it comes to developing skin cancer. If you think about the number of individuals in our country who actually are being treated for skin cancer, the number is staggering because it's close to 
5 million people are getting treated for skin cancer in this country every year. And if you think about in terms of how much it um, drains our healthcare resources, you can see that it's staggering when you think about $8.1 billion is actually being um, allocated just to the treatment of skin cancer. So the type of skin cancers that I'm gonna talk about are basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer, and melanoma. Now, there are other skin cancers, but probably not as um, frequently seen. And I think it's important to understand skin cancer in the context of these uh, three types. Um, it's important to know that, you know, for many people when they develop skin cancer, um, the type of skin cancer that they develop will determine the type of treatment. But in general, it's in, to understand skin cancer, I think it's important to have an appreciation of these types of skin cancers. Um, basal cell cancers and squamous cell cancers tend to be treated more with the dermatologist. Um, and melanoma, which can be diagnosed by a dermatologist, that's when you tend to get involved with other individuals like myself being a surgical oncologist or a cancer surgeon. So before we talk about each of these type of skin cancers, I think we have to understand where do these skin cancers come from? So if you look at the skin and the way it's depicted on this diagram, you can see that the skin um, is really made up of layers. Um, the top layer of the skin, we call it the epidermis, is the, is the outer part of our skin, and that's the outer coating. And then just beneath the epidermis is what we call the dermis. And then the dermis, which really connects the epidermis to the rest of our body, is then connected to that layer beneath the skin, and that's called the subcut subcutaneous level or subcutis. Um, although my anatomy professor would probably hit me across the head for this analogy, but the way I look at skin is think about it, about it as grass. Um, the blades of grass are the epidermis of your skin, and the roots that hold the blades of grass to the, to the ground, that's the dermis. And then, of course, the ground itself, the soil below, that's the subcutis or is the subcutaneous uh, part of the body. If you focus on the epidermis, the outer layer, and again, because the skin is an organ, it's a collection of organized um, cells of different cell types, you can see that there are different cells just within the epidermis. But it's each of these cell types that could go through some sort of change. And it's that change that could lead to the development of skin cancer. Um, at the base of the epidermis, there's a layer of cells. We call them the basal cells. And those are the cells where um, a lot of activity is going on because it's those cells that help to regenerate all of the skin cells because we know that the skin can turn over very, very quickly. But when those basal cells begin to change, and when that change leads to the development of cancer, um, that's what basal cell cancer um, is developed into, and it's caused by those basal cells. The squamous cells, which makes up a good portion of the epidermis, those cells can go on to develop cancer, and that's what causes squamous cell cancer. There are cells within the epidermis that give us skin color. We call them the melanocytes. Dark complexion people have a lot of melanocytes. Light complexion people may have less melanocytes. But it's those melanocytes or those pigmented cells that can go on and develop into cancer. And it's those melanocytes that develop melanoma. So when you talk about skin cancer, you need to understand what are the risk factors. And it's important to understand what could potentially cause skin cancer. Now, there are going to be factors that we can potentially control, but I will say there are a lot of factors that we really have no control over in terms of developing skin cancer. Um, probably one of the biggest risk factors that we tend not to focus upon is age. Now, when you think about the number of individuals that are developing skin cancer, I said that one in five Americans develop skin cancer. The truth of the matter is, is that the incidence or the risk of skin cancer has been increasing over the years. Well, 
in some ways, that's a good thing because of the fact that we are all living longer. And it turns out that as we age, our skin goes through changes. And being the fact that our skin is going through such changes, unfortunately, it's those changes can, that can lead to the development of skin cancer. So age in itself is a significant risk factor for developing skin cancer. And that's basically all types of skin cancer. So as we get older, it's just a fact of life that we have an increased risk of developing skin cancer. Probably the most important factor that we have the, the potential to control is sun exposure. And it's particularly the ultraviolet rays that come from the sun. It's the exposure to those ultraviolet rays that cause changes within our skin. And it's those changes caused by the sun and the ultraviolet rays that lead to the development of skin cancer. So again, it's important to understand that if we can at least understand what the sun and the ultraviolet rays can do to our skin, hopefully that can help to reduce our chances of developing skin cancer. The important thing to realize is that ultraviolet rays are not always obtained from sunlight. And there are ways that we can receive ultraviolet rays. And obviously it's the reason by which we actually do not like people going into tanning salons because it's those tanning salons that give ultraviolet rays that help to provide someone with a tan. But unfortunately, it cannot avoid those changes that can lead to the development of skin cancer. So some ways of trying to decide who is someone that could develop skin cancer, sometimes you can understand based on someone's history of how they've been exposed to the sun. Individuals that tend to have what I consider more sensitive skin when they're out in the sun are those individuals who tend to burn very easily. Obviously, there are people out there who say they just go out into the sun very briefly and they tend to get sunburn. But it's those people who tend to get frequent sunburns and it, what I would say really severe sunburns, you know, where you get that blistering sunburn, you get a lot of peeling. When you see those individuals who tend to get a, a lot of sunburns, those are individuals that might be at increased risk for developing skin cancer. Now, again, it could be those individuals who are fair complexion, but it also could be those individuals who want to spend a lot of time in the sun and are probably not protecting themselves from the ultraviolet rays that come from the sun. Truth is, we all do not have the same uh, skin color and there are people out there with lighter complexion and it seems to correlate also with people who have um, lighter eye color. So people who tend to have blue eyes, green eyes, um, those individuals are gonna probably have um, a greater risk of developing skin cancer, which usually is initiated by exposure to the sun or exposure to ultraviolet rays. So again, people who tend to have lighter skin, a lighter complexion, people who tend to have a, a lighter eye color, probably have to take more into account the fact that they may be at greater risk of developing skin cancer and should take measures to protect themselves. If you have a family history of skin cancer, it could very well be it's that you, because you all have the same type of skin complexion, it could be the fact that you all probably spend a lot of time in the sun, you know, doing things together. And so family history, although it could lead, it could consider the possibility that there might be a genetic factor, it's probably also more so a reason that we all tend to do things together as a family. And so when you see a family history of skin cancer, you have to understand that if there are individuals in your family who are developing skin cancer, that also may tell you that you might be at risk for developing skin cancer. The one thing I always say to people is, is that once you've developed skin cancer, then it stands to prove that you could develop more skin cancers in your lifetime. And so if you become someone that unfortunately develops skin cancer, um, and again, one in five people could develop skin cancer, it could very well be that you need to make changes. And more importantly, is also the fact that you need to be vigilant with yourself to see someone like a dermatologist regularly to have your skin checked because of the fact that if you've had skin cancer treated once, you need to be watchful for any other skin cancers that might develop. There are other individuals that might be at risk for skin cancer. Um, people who seem to have um, chronic inflammatory processes that involve the skin. Um, 
a good example of this are people who have open wounds that won't heal. Um, people who tend to have these type of wounds, uh, for some reason, the skin is trying to heal over that area, but because of the fact it's stressed, that could lead to the development of skin cancer. Now, I will say that doesn't mean every wound is going to develop skin cancer, but at least it's to say that if you have a wound that just won't heal, you really have to bring that to the attention of your doctor because it could be a problem. And for some individuals, not often, it could be the fact that they may be developing a skin cancer in that area. The other thing to consider is the immune system. I think we take, in to, we take granted the importance of our immune system, but it's the fact that certain individuals, and for good reason, may have a suppressed immune system. Um, we see skin cancer, especially in our transplant population. There are a lot of individuals out there who are kidney transplant recipients, liver transplant recipients, and they have to have medications to suppress their immune system so that they do not reject their organ. Those individuals really have to be watched carefully by a dermatologist because they are at risk for developing skin cancer. Finally, there are other environmental factors that we probably still don't understand, and it's those environmental factors that probably um, sensitize our skin to developing skin cancer. So you hear about those things and you have to be aware that when we're exposed to those environmental factors, again, we have to be particularly careful exposing ourselves to the sun. So let's talk a little bit about ultraviolet rays. It turns out that ultraviolet rays that come from the sun are actually made up of three different types. And if you look at the most common uh, ultraviolet ray that comes from the sun, we call that ultraviolet A. And so that makes up most of what comes from the sunlight. Um, it turns out that ultraviolet A is what causes us to age. It makes our skin wrinkle. It causes a lot of that skin damage we see as we age because we spend so much time in the sun. But it's the ultraviolet B that tends to be a much stronger type of um, light that comes and from the sun and can cause more significant damage to the skin. It turns out that because it is much stronger, it can cause sunburns. And it's believed that ultraviolet B can actually cause the changes, changes within the genetic material of our skin cells that can lead to the development of skin cancer. It turns out that there's actually another ultraviolet ray that comes from the sun and that's ultraviolet C, but we, know, we don't see that thankfully because it is extremely lethal. So if any of you are planning on going into space, uh, obviously this is a situation where you have to be protective of that because um, beyond the atmosphere, the exposure of ultraviolet C can be um, deadly. So let's talk about the specific uh, skin cancers. And I won't spend too much time on each of them, there are probably people within that are listening to this lecture that may have had any one of these skin cancers and probably would like to know more about it. But what I'd like to try to do is give an overview of each of these skin cancers, just to give you a sense in terms of, you know, how we look at them. More importantly, how do we diagnose them and how do we treat them? Um, the most common skin cancer is actually basal cell cancer. And again, remember those basal cells that are at the base of the epidermis. It's those cells that actually lead to the development of basal cell cancer. Being that it is a most common cancer, um, it usually occurs on sun-exposed areas. Um, and so you see a lot of individuals who develop it on their face, um, on their shoulders or arms. Um, then we see them a lot on their ears. And it turns out that basal cell cancer can be quite a slow-growing cancer. Um, it tends to be more of a local problem. That is that um, as basal cell cancer grows, it doesn't tend to spread or metastasize into the body. And so being a local problem, if it's not treated or if it's left um, to grow continu continually, it can lead to significant destruction of the skin. So if it's not properly treated, it can cause some real problems. It can cause some very deep ulcers of the skin. Um, but being that it's a very slow growing tumor, or a slow growing cancer, many times it's picked up and then usually treated by the dermatologist. The second most common cancer is called squamous cell cancer. And remember that the majority of the cells that make up the epidermis, those are the squamous cells, 
it's within those cells that the changes that occur, and that's what actually develops squamous cell cancer. Um, squamous cell cancer tends to develop in skin that is severely damaged. And so in those areas, again, that are, tend to be heavily exposed, but especially in those individuals who are already showing signs of um, damaged skin because of excessive sun or ultraviolet exposure, um, that's where squamous cell cancer may tend to develop. It's also important to know that you don't necessarily have to develop skin cancer in an area where you have excessive skin exposure. And again, remember we talked about those individuals who might be at increased risk for developing skin cancer. Remember talking about areas where there might be inflammation like wounds. Uh, those wounds can develop squamous cell cancer, but also people who are immunosuppressed they can develop squamous cell cancer. And again, it doesn't always have to be in sun damaged skin. Squamous cell cancer, um, similar to basal cell cancer, tends to be more of a local problem. It doesn't always metastasize, although in some situations, there can be at times situations where it can be, become more aggressive. And unfortunately, when squamous cell cancer takes on a more aggressive behavior, it could potentially spread or metastasize within the body, and that can be a much more difficult scenario to treat. There are precursor lesions um, that dermatologists tend to look for that can at least alert the possibility that a squamous cell cancer can develop. So if you go to the dermatologist and they see something like what's called a keratosis, um, in this case, an actinic keratosis, this is an area of flaking uh, skin um, that could lead to the development of squamous cell cancer. And so dermatologists tend to look out for these type of lesions because they know that if they can take care of those lesions, they potentially could prevent squamous cell cancer. Now, not all flaking lesions of the skin, not all keratoses are going to be actinic keratoses. Not all of those lesions are going to develop squamous cell cancer. But it's just important to know that there are precursor lesions or pre-malignant conditions uh, that could be detected before squamous cell cancer develops. Um, the picture that I'm actually showing you is a squamous cell cancer, and this is an individual who has a, of a dark skin. And so again, it's important to realize is that squamous cell cancer, like many other cancers, does not discriminate. It can occur in fair-skinned people, but it can also occur in dark complexion people. So in terms of the treatment options for both squamous cell cancer and basal cell cancers, again, probably the majority of these type of cancers are going to be treated in the dermatologist's office. Um, surgery can be done for many of these type of cancers. And surgery, again, tend, since it is a local problem, just requires that you excise those lesions completely back to normal skin. And because as long as it's not involving a large area of the skin, it can be a minor procedure or a procedure that can be done as an outpatient many times in the office. A topic that seems to come up a lot when people talk to me is Mohs surgery. And people ask me, what is Mohs surgery? Mohs surgery is actually a type of procedure that is done, again, in a dermatologist's office. And it's usually done by a what we call a dermatologic surgeon. So it's a dermatologist who actually has special training in doing um, outpatient surgery. And the idea is, is that because if there is a squamous cell cancer or a basal cell cancer that needs to be excised, and in some situations, it may be difficult just by visualization to tell how much of the skin is involved, what the dermatologic surgeon will do is they will attempt to excise the cancer from the skin, but at the time, realizing that when they excise and they excise close to what looks to be the clear margins around the cancer, they then take that specimen and look at it carefully under what's considered frozen section, where they can look microscopically at the margins right then and there in the office. And if they see that they have not cleared the margins, if they have not gotten back to what looks to be normal skin, then while the patient is waiting in their office, they can go back and take more tissue around the area until they're assured that they have cleared the area of the cancer. So a Mohs procedure or a Mohs surgery can be, um, it can be a prolonged procedure, 
but the patient is made comfortable. And the, the good thing is, is that at least the patient can leave the office knowing that their skin cancer has been completely excised. Now, not all skin cancers, squamous cell cancers and basal cell cancers require excision. Um, many times the dermatologist may decide just to destroy or what we call ablate those skin cancers. So they can either just core it out, cure it, or they can actually burn it through electro desiccation, or they can even decide to freeze it. In, and that's just another way of treating a, a skin cancer, which doesn't necessarily require excision. There are other methods that the dermatologist can use. They can use light therapy, laser therapy, and there are certain topical agents that the dermatologist may decide to give to help treat the area if they think it's prone to developing skin cancer, or the fact is that the skin cancer may be amenable to a non-operative um, approach to treat. So, the third skin cancer that I want to talk about is melanoma, and this is probably where I tend to get more involved because the um, significant amount of my practice is actually in the treatment of melanoma, being that I am a cancer surgeon, a surgical oncologist. Uh, some facts about melanoma is that um, people who do die of skin cancer, the majority of those individuals probably have been diagnosed with melanoma, and usually deaths from melanoma are caused by the spread of melanoma into the body or what's called metastasis. That's why it's always better for us to be able to diagnose and treat melanoma before it metastasizes because the prognosis, the chance for cure is so much greater. Um, it is important to know that even though when melanoma does metastasize, we now have treatments that I will talk about and there has been significant changes in terms of how we are able to treat melanoma. The incidence of melanoma, just like other skin cancers, is increasing as well. But what's important to understand is, is that, just as I said, the increase in skin cancers is due to the fact that the population is um, living longer. The fact with melanoma is, is that we're seeing something that's also disturbing. Um, it turns out that in young adults, individuals between the age of 25 and 29, um, Melanoma is the most common cancer. And so we are seeing an increase in the number of melanomas in young people. So as much as we're seeing an increase in melanoma, because I see a lot of individuals who are in their 80s and 90s, because they've obviously taken care of themselves to be able to live so long, um, I get worried when I see the number of young individuals who come into my office with melanoma, because we're seeing, again, a number of those individuals. And the question is why? Um, the concern may be that maybe they're just spending more time in the sun and they're not taking um, good precautions in pre reducing sun exposure. By far, melanoma is caused by ultraviolet rays, and it's the ultraviolet exposure that really concerns us because of the fact that we're seeing an increase in melanoma in young people. Um, it actually has been due to studies that have been done of individuals, young individuals, who uh, spend time in tanning salons. And it was those studies, especially when they saw that there was a marked increase in women under the age of 45, because many women do go, um, it's more women than men that tend to go into tanning salons, that we saw that there was an uptick, an increase in melanoma. And I think it's because of that, that we had to be at least um, vigilant about the idea of saying to people, if you're going to go into a tanning salon, you have to realize that it increases your risk for skin cancer, but the type of skin cancer that you may develop could be a, a potentially lethal one like melanoma. It also turns out that when you use uh, certain sunscreens and you take precautions, you do see that there is a decrease in melanoma. So we do, because melanoma is carefully monitored um, when we look for the type of cancers that develop in our society, we do see that individuals who do take precautions, like the use of sunscreen, do reduce the risk of developing melanoma. Now, many people think, does melanoma always come from a mole? Well, many do, and you could have a mole from childbirth that goes through some sort of change sometime in your life, and that could lead to development of melanoma. 
but not all melanomas develop from a mole and they can occur in areas of the skin where there was no mole to begin with. And in certain individuals, like for instance, people with darker complexion who probably have a less likely chance of developing melanoma, it turns out they still can develop melanoma. Um, a good example is Bob Marley. If there's people out there know who Bob Marley is, um, a famous reggae singer, he died of melanoma and he had got melanoma on the uh, soles of his feet, of, a, of his foot. And that's actually what led to his unfortunate death. So you can develop melanoma sometimes in unusual places. So people say, well, how do you know if a mole is turning into a melanoma? And so one thing people talk about are the ABCDEs of melanoma. And what it is, is that if you look at a skin lesion like a mole and you're saying to yourself, when should I be worried or when should I bring it to the attention of my doctor? Um, there are certain characteristics that you can look at. For instance, if you look at A, asymmetry, if it looks like one half, if you look at the mole or the lesion, the skin lesion, and you look at half, one half of it, and then you look at the other half, and if it looks like they're both very different, that's what we consider asymmetry. Or B, if the border of the, of the skin lesion is very irregular, that could very well be um, a telltale sign that it might be developing into a melanoma. Um, if, if the color of the skin lesion has different variations, if it's from deep black to light, but the fact is, is that there's variations within the lesion itself, that could be another feature, and that's what we consider C. And if it's getting bigger, if it's growing to the point where it's getting larger, and I usually use the size of a pencil eraser, if it looks like it's getting beyond that size, and it's continuing to grow, that might be a situation where you have to bring it to the attention of your doctor. Probably the most important thing to realize is E, and that is any skin lesion that's continuing to change, what I call evolution, because sometimes it may not follow the A, B, C, and D, but if it is changing, then that's a situation where if there is a skin lesion that is concerning you, you need to bring it up to your doctor because it might require a biopsy either by your doctor or a referral to a dermatologist. So let's talk about the treatment of melanoma because it is different in terms of treatment than what I've told you about with squamous cell and basal cell cancer. By far the treatment of melanoma is surgery. Um, and then again, that's where I tend to get involved. But because melanoma has the potential risk of spreading, many times when I see a patient who requires surgery to excise their melanoma, I also need to consider what is the possibility that the melanoma could have spread. And so we then look or investigate to see if there has been any spread of melanoma. That's what we call staging the tumor or staging the melanoma. Um, probably the most um, sensitive way of detecting spread of melanoma is actually through a procedure that is done at the time of the excision of the melanoma, and that's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Now, many of you, if you've heard that word before, probably heard it in the context of breast cancer, because sentinel lymph node biopsy more frequently is used for the staging or the identification of spread of breast cancer. But it turns out that actually the sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure was first developed for melanoma. And what it involves is, is that there is an injection done. If you see in that top picture, you can sign, see a shadow of a person's head and you can see there's a very dark blotch. That very dark blotch is where the melanoma is located. And in this case, a radiologist has injected a, a, a radioactive dye. It's a weak radioactive dye that's not harmful right in the area where the melanoma is. That dye is actually picked up by the lymph system and it travels to the lymph nodes. And so where you see the other smaller uh, black dots, uh, those arrows, those are lymph nodes around the larger black dot, which is the melanoma. And it's those smaller black dots that sig signify where the lymph nodes are. Now those lymph nodes are tied into that area where the melanoma is. And it's those lymph nodes that we consider as the sentinel lymph nodes. So if you look at the lower picture, where you, if you were to make an incision over one of those areas where the, the sentinel lymph node is, and by use of another dye that we tend to inject at the time of surgery, 
a, a blue dye that we can see with our own eyes, we can actually depict or pick up where that lymph node is. By finding the sentinel lymph node and removing it, we can actually have a pathologist tell us um, with accuracy whether there has been actual spread of the melanoma to the lymph nodes. Because once we know there has been spread to the lymph nodes, then we know there is the risk that it could have spread further, and that could lead to other therapies um, beyond surgery. The sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure is very important because it can detect the spread of melanoma um, down to a few cells, which is why we tend to use it uh, predominantly over scans like PET scans, CAT scans, MRIs. And it, in fact, it's usually after we detect spread of melanoma to the sentinel lymph node, that's when we decide to order additional scans to see if there has been any spread beyond the lymph nodes. Now, like I said, the treatment of melanoma has significantly changed. And so for those unfortunate individuals who may have developed melanoma, but also now have shown sign of spread, it turns out that over the past five to 10 years, there has been significant changes in the treatment of melanoma. And it is also affecting how we're treating cancer in general. One area that it really has opened up is this area of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is the use of your body's own immune system to target and to eradicate, to remove all of the cancer. And it requires that your immune system be altered by providing um, drug therapy. So for patients who may have melanoma, um, it turns out that if there has been any sign of spread, we then refer those patients to a medical oncologist. And the medical oncologist can then um, order um, medications that are usually given as an infusion, um, usually every three to four weeks. Now, these drugs are not what we consider as chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is when you give drug therapy um, to actually kill the cancer cells. These immunotherapy drugs actually alter the immune system. And what they do basically is they change your immune system and enhance your immune system so it will then turn against your cancer, in this case, melanoma. For those people who probably have seen commercials regarding Keytruda, Optivo, you see all these commercials about um, how it's treating lung cancer, breast cancer. It turns out that these drugs were first used for melanoma. And because of the success it has in treating melanoma, it's now being used for these other type of cancers. The reason it's so important and why it's such a game changer is, is that unlike chemotherapy, where in order to kill the cancer, you have to be exposed to the chemotherapy drug because it is the chemotherapy drug that kills the cancer cells. But once you stop receiving the chemotherapy drug, if there are still cancer cells within the body, they're going to continue to grow. With immunotherapy, if you were to receive the drugs that change your immune system, and if you were to stop giving that therapy, because you usually do at a point in time, it could very well be that your immune system could stay that way forever. And so as your body uh, continues to surveil against melanoma, if it turns out that there may be melanoma cells that are dormant within your system, within your body, it will be your immune cells that will hopefully encounter them. And because your immune cells have been altered by the immunotherapy, it could very well destroy that melanoma cell before it could show up again somewhere else in your body. So again, it has the potential to cure people who even have advanced stage four melanoma. So I tried to give you an overview of what I consider the most important skin cancers, but I think what I really want to spend the time remaining on and give some time also for people to ask questions is, you know, what should we do to avoid skin cancer? Again, there are a lot of things that we can't avoid the fact that we are getting older. Um, the fact is we can't you know, change the way our skin is in terms of our complexion. But knowing that most skin cancers are caused by sun exposure or exposure to ultraviolet rays, the truth of the matter is, is that we have to be careful when we're out in the sun. Um, there was a, a program years back that was very popular to try to um, tell people about um, the risk of skin cancer, and it was um, slip, slap, slop, and wrap. And the important thing to realize is that 
you know, when we are out in the sun, um, I think it's important that we do wear clothing. And of course, you know, people want to wear shorts, people want to wear short sleeves, um, people, you know, want to be able to expose themselves. But if you know that you are at risk of developing skin cancer, if you're someone who has had skin cancer, um, you know, you really, really want to consider wearing clothing um, just to try to protect yourself. Now, people say, should you do that all day long? And the question is, you should, you should try to at least do it in times when you know the skin or when the sun is at its greatest. So if you consider the time between, I consider 11 and 3 three o'clock, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., um, the sun's rays are probably at its strongest. So that's when you have to take probably greater precautions. Um, wear a hat, you know, someone like myself, I always wear a hat when I'm outside because, um, and I will say that there are times I don't wear a hat and sure enough, I get burned on the top of my head. So, you know, for men who don't have hair, you really have to be careful and wear a hat when you're out in the sun. I think sunscreen is very, very important. And the dermatologic societies say that you really should try to find a good sunscreen um, of an SPF, that's a sun protective factor of at least 30. I think if you get above 50, it's probably um, not gonna add any additional benefit. But I think if you get something from 30 to 50, there are so many types of uh, sunscreen out there. And although recently there was some um, concerns about spray on sunscreens because they were contaminated with benzene, a potential carcinogen. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that in general, sunscreens are safe. What you want to do is find a sunscreen that you like using because you need to apply it. And many times it'll tell you, you should apply it before you go out in the sun. So that it has a chance to set into your skin. And if it says you have to reapply after a period of time, reapply. So again, try and find a product that you really, really like. The fact of the matter is you should try to use it all year long, you know, just for the fact that the summertime is when you worry about getting sunburned. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that you still get exposed to sun and the ultraviolet rays during the winter time. And even in situations when it's overcast, you really have to be careful because um, there is ultraviolet rays that come through the cloud cover. And wear sunglasses. Uh, sunglasses are important because of the fact is, is that it does protect our eyes. And I'm really an individual that says, you know, you really do not want to go into tanning salons. Um, there are spray on tans. They may not be the best, but it's a, I think it's a safer substitute than going into the tanning salon. The other thing to consider is, you know, when should you be checked? And I think that's where you have to have a conversation with your doctor. I think if you have many moles and you're concerned about those moles, if you have a mole or even a skin lesion, that's not a mole that is changing. Be your own advocate, go to your doctor, say to your doctor, I'd like you to look at this. Cause then your doctor can say, okay, it's something that needs to be looked at. They may refer you to a dermatologist. They may feel comfortable doing a, a skin biopsy in the office. But the fact of the matter is, is that just because we all go in for a checkup, don't assume that your doctor is going to do that. If you have a wound that won't heal, that's another situation. The one thing I always tell my uh, melanoma patients is, is that, you know, because of the fact that they themselves have melanoma and many times, thankfully, I can treat them with surgery alone. I tell them that they're going to be a, um, a friend, their dermatologist is going to be their friend for life because if they have a personal history of skin cancer, if they've had now melanoma once, they could develop melanoma again. They could also develop basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer, so that I make sure that they go back and they stay with their dermatologist because it's their, going to be their dermatologist that's going to provide the care and continue to surveil their skin for the rest of their life. For those individuals that may have a family member with skin cancer, and if you think you have similar complexion, if you think you're that same type of person who tends to spend time out in the sun, it might be a good idea to go ahead and initiate a consultation with a dermatologist so that dermatologist can tell you how often you should be checked. If you're someone who has a weakened immune system, again, I talk about transplant individuals, but there are other diseases out there that you know require medications, people who have inflammatory bowel disease, who are on these new drugs that can suppress the immune system, you just have to be um, 
understanding of what that means and talk to your doctor does that and say do you think that this could be a situation where i need to be more careful about my skin if you're someone who's probably spent a lot of time in the sun in the past especially when you're younger and had some really bad sunburns as you get older again the risk of skin cancer increases but if your past has been such that you did spend a lot of time in the sun had a lot of blistering sunburns that might be a situation where you have to say to yourself look you know, maybe I need to be more careful. Maybe I need to have someone keep an eye on me. I put this because I think this is one of the things I really um, am um, trying to stress to a lot of people. And I say, who's got your back? It's unfortunate because ever so often, and thankfully it isn't often, that I see an individual in my office who has a very large melanoma in the back. And it's on their back in an area where they can't see it. And I go back into the record and I see that this patient has been seen by many, many doctors. And I think to myself, how did this get missed? Now, I will say that many of us go to our doctors and nowadays we really don't get undressed. So what I tell people is, who's got your back? Who's going to look in those areas of your body where you can't look? And if you have someone that you trust at home that can take a look, then that's good. But for people who don't feel comfortable with that, for people who don't have somebody. What I tell them is when you go to see your doctor, take your shirt off, you know, take your clothes off. Your doctor's probably gonna look at you and say, what are you doing? And you can say, look, at, I want you to look at my back. I want you to look at parts of my body where I can't see, because again, you have to be your own advocate in this. Um, again, seeing individuals who probably had something that could have been detected because they had seen a doctor before, that really is not right. And I think that, again, we have to really take um, our health into our own hands sometimes. And so I do use that as a, uh, a point to stress to many individuals when I give talks like this. Um, I'm going to end here. I thank you for your time. And I hope this um, helped give you some context about skin cancer, but also maybe give you some good advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arenas. That was really great. What great information. Uh, interesting about Bob Marley. I didn't know that. And um, <laughs> really terrific overview. Thank you for sharing that. We do have um, a couple of questions Good. in the, in the Q&A box. Um, the first one is from Mary Ellen. She'd like to know, are the mineral, in quotes, sunscreens, uh, titanium and zinc oxide as effective with the same SPF? So I do think they have a fairly high SPF, and I think it has to do with the concentration of mil minerals in there. Um, if you use zinc oxide, and I've seen some <clears throat> preparations of zinc oxide, um, actually have an SPF, I think, up to 100. Now, I will say that using that can sometimes be kind of a little bit on the thick side if you really are caking it on. Although I have seen preparations where you, you can actually apply it um, to the point where you don't even see that white, you know, um, material, you know, precipitate on your skin. So I will say that it depends, I think, on the concentration of the minerals within that actual preparation that you're using. So it could vary in terms of SPF. Um, it's an, the use of minerals is, is, an, is a, an old um, preparation, but it's still very effective. Um, people have been concerned about certain chemicals, you know, could they have other harm? But I think people have done tests and we do find that there are other um, preparations out there that are just as effective. Great, thank you for that. Uh, there is a question um, to um, people who already have like a skin condition like psoriasis, do they have more of a chance of getting skin cancer? So I don't know of any studies and speaking with my dermatology colleagues, I don't see um, really any correlation. And the truth of the matter is, is that when you think about the people, again, mostly melanoma patients that come to my office, I don't see, you know, 
an increased frequency of those people having these other skin problems. Um, I think that what people understand is, is that when you have these other skin problems um, and require treatment, um, nowadays, even some of these treatments may require the use of the, what they call these biologic drugs. Um, and these biologic drugs have some effect on the skin's own immune system because our skin actually is part of our immune system. Um, so the question comes up, at least now, is could that change your risk of developing skin cancer? And truth to tell, I don't think there has been any correlation with that. So I think although there is, obviously there are other conditions that can cause problems within our skin, the good news is that it doesn't seem to put you at greater risk for developing skin cancer. Well, that's great news. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't, um, I don't see any other questions here in the Q&A box. Okay. Uh, um, a, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's one other thing I didn't put into the lecture and I just wanted, because again, I wanted to provide time for questions, but I'm going to throw something out there and it's it's very well published and it's i didn't put it into the lecture tonight was um vitamin d um vitamin d is interesting because vitamin d is actually a vitamin that's produced by our bodies it's produced by the skin and it's actually produced by our skin in response to sunlight um the tanning salon people love that because they said you know go to your tanning salon and get vitamin d but the truth of the matter is is that the fact that your skin produces it means that it, it plays an important factor with what are probably um, crucial biologic pathways within our skin. But you can actually take vitamin D um, as an oral supplement, and it's very safe. Um, it's not something that you can harm yourself if you take more. And there has been enough data out there to show that people who have higher vitamin D levels tend to have a lower chance of developing skin cancer. So what I always tell my melanoma patients, um, and, I, and I encourage you to consider, is um, taking vitamin D as a supplement, especially if you um, are someone who may have a low level of vitamin D. Now, I don't advocate everybody going out and getting their vitamin D levels checked, although some primary care doctors will do that. But the fact is, taking vitamin D has the potential of lowering your risk of skin cancer, and that's all skin cancers. Um, including melanoma. So it, it's something to consider. And, you know, again, it's, it's safe. Um, you can buy it, obviously, over the counter. Uh, most of the time, it's 1,000 to 2,000 unit tablets. Um, I take it every day. Um, it lowers um, the risk of colon cancer when it's taken with calcium. It lowers the risk of breast cancer in women. So it really is a win-win. And so I just add that in there because I didn't include it because I didn't know how much time I would have in the talk, but I think it's something to consider. And if you're not sure, talk to your doctor about it. But I think if you were to go and look online, I think you will see there is there has been a lot of data published on vitamin D levels and the fact that it correlates with skin cancer risk. That is really exciting news. So thank you for that. Um, we do have um, four questions. Okay. Sorry, Am uh, I, sorry, Amanda, I didn't see your questions, but I'm seeing them now. Um, the first one is, what are examples of environmental factors that contribute to uh, skin cancer? Well, so it, there's actually one very old environmental factor. It turns out arsenic. Arsenic um, was considered a, a concern because I think in the old days, if people took arsenic for reasons, I can't say why, um, that increased your risk for skin cancers. Um, I can't give examples per se, but I will say that the reason I put that in there is, as one of a risk factor is because we've been trying to figure out why there may be an increase of skin cancer, especially in individuals, not always older individuals. And there has been um, work and there still is research going on that certain chemicals that we tend to expose ourselves with, with may actually cause changes to our skin. And it may be these environmental factors or chemicals that might not necessarily cause skin cancer, but it might make our skin more sensitive 
so that if we are out in the sun or we're exposed to ultraviolet rays, it might cause those changes. So there is a lot of investigation out there to try to see what sensitizers are out there. But unfortunately, I can't say offhand, you know, what's a good example, except for, like I said, something from the old days, which is arsenic. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what's the lifespan of immuno immunotherapy? Can you get boosters? So we're still learning about this. Um, the clinical trials that went on probably about 10 years ago, those patients who were the first to try that drug for melanoma are still being followed. What's fascinating is, is that because the immune system has memory, you think about us having allergies from year to year, um, people who have been treated with immunotherapy who had what we consider late stage or metastatic melanoma and responded to the point where their melanoma is no longer within their body, those people who continue to be followed, um, many of them still are not showing any signs of recurrence. Now, the question comes up is, well, what happens if you do get a recurrence? Could you then retreat? And the answer is yes, you could retreat. And because there are other newer immunotherapy drugs that can further change or tweak our immune system, the fact of the matter is, is that we have the ability now to use our own immune system to get rid of cancer. And I think that's why the whole area of oncology is changing. Um, so yes, there is the potential to retreat. I guess you could call it a booster. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that there is the potential uh, benefit that we could get our immune system to the point where it will no, not require any further adaptation and it will just stay with us in terms of guarding us against a particular cancer that we may have had and was successfully uh, cured of. That's really exciting to hear. Thank you. Uh, Diane has a question. Um, what about taking nicotinamide vitamin B3? That's a very good question. Um, I So the, the dermatologists um, have other interventions um, that they can use to help lower the risk of skin cancer. And nicotinamide is actually a medication or it's, it's kind of a, um, it's, it's kind of a vitamin. It's, I think it is a vitamin and it many times it's the dermatologist who will prescribe this. It seems studies have shown that it will lower the risk of skin cancers, especially squamous cell cancer. So I've heard, for instance, people who tend to have significant number of squamous cell cancers, nicotinamide can help. Um, it, it's something that, you know, I would say if you're going to try using that, um, that's something you probably want to talk to your doctor about. And I suspect it'll be a dermatologist who would be the one to advocate for that. Great. Thank you. Um, Mary Ellen wanted to say thank you. It's been very informative. Thank you so and much. <laughs> Amanda, I uh, don't see any more questions from you. Um, we just have about one more minute if you want to type them really quick. But uh, what a great seminar and a really exciting treatment for melanoma. That's tr really terrific news. It is. Uh, well, it looks like uh, we're at time and we don't have any more questions coming in oh, oh there's one more okay we have okay. one minute is there any circumstance where sun exposure has helpful benefit that outweighs the risk of exposure um i mean i i, I it's a tough question because i think we do need to spend time in the sun because i think it does have its benefits in many ways um I think the problem is overexposure and, you know, and it's funny because I have patients who obviously who have been treated with melanoma and, you know, I don't want them to be sun phobes. Um, honestly, I think that being out in the sun probably has a lot of psychologic benefit. I mean, especially when the time of COVID and everything, I think all of us were happy when the days got longer, the, you know, the weather got warmer. So I think that, um, it's important to know that, you know, 
you don't have to be afraid of the sun. Um, but, you know, I think that it's just important to know that sun exposure can cause changes to our skin. And for some people, you know, who are more prone to burn, you got to be more careful. And, you know, the good news is that you can go out in the sun. You just have to do certain things to protect yourself from the sun if you want to spend a significant amount of time out there. Uh, this is an interesting last question. Is there anything like an oral sunscreen or food that can make you more resistant to UV, UV rays? I, you know, I, I know that there has been research towards that end. And I, to this date, I don't think I've heard of anybody that has any, you know, anything out there that has been used for it. So uh, I don't know of anything like that. I think it would be great. It, it, you know, it'd be fascinating. Um, but, yeah. you know, I think it's, um, remains to be seen. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for this great talk, and we appreciate your expertise. All right. Thank you. Thank you.